The Holy Gospel according to Luke. The devil said to Jesus, To you I will give you their glory and all this authority, for it has been given over to me, and I give it to anyone I please. If you then will worship me, it will all be yours. Jesus answered the devil, It is written, Worship the Lord your God, the Lord alone you serve. Then the devil took Jesus to Jerusalem and placed him on the pinnacle of the temple, saying to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down from here, for it is written, God will command his angels concerning you to protect you, and on their hands they will bear you up, so that you will not dash your foot against a stone. Jesus answered the devil, It is said, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. Having finished every test, the devil departed from Jesus until an opportune time. Then Jesus, filled with the power of the Spirit, returned to Galilee, and a report about him spread through all of the surrounding country. He began to teach in their synagogues and was praised by everyone. When Jesus came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, as was his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unscrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. The Lord has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of the sight of the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And Jesus rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. Then he began to say to them, Today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise the Lord, everyone. It is good to be in the presence of the Lord and in your presence. To presiding Bishop, uh, Bishop Eaton, to the bishops of the church, to those of you who provide leadership as pastors and laypersons, to you, men and women who are called to God, I greet you in the precious name of Jesus, who is still the Christ. Pray with me now as we take a look at two particular scriptures. The first in Isaiah, the sixth chapter, verses 1 through 9. I will just begin reading at the fifth verse. Woe to me, I cried, I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips. I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Also, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? Then I said, here am I, send me. Now from the Gospel of Luke, the fourth chapter and the 13th verse, when the devil had finished every test, he departed from him until an opportune time. And our theme and thought of meditation in this hour is push pause. Now, I'm used to people talking back to me, and you're used to listening. And so between me wanting you to talk back to me and you listening, I think we might be able to meet halfway. If you agree, say amen. amen. Oh, we're going to get along just fine. So this is where I would say, in my faith tradition, turn to your neighbor and say, push pause. All right. So you did that with the band, so I know you can hang with me, right? Try it again on this side. Turn to your neighbor and say, push pause. push pause. Here in Isaiah, in our text, Isaiah is having a life-changing experience that occurred after a great loss that leads to a great change. The problem was that Israel had become too complacent in his own security. They were corrupted in their prosperity, and they thought somehow they could escape the wrath of God. 
An invitation was extended within what scholars would call a theophany, a personal encounter with God. Another ideation is that there is tension between the, O oh Lord, I am undone, and the here am I, send me. In between the two realities, there could be discerned a pause that is powerful. And the invitation was extended to him centuries ago. And the same invitation is extended to us in this present generation. What invitation? Well, you are cordially invited to become a new creature in Jesus Christ, forgetting what is behind and strain forward to the new you. The invitation to examine the past and decide what you need to let go of and what to keep. To be patient with yourself when you want things to be over and it's not over. And when you want the things to end and it's not ending. Where you want to land, but you land where the Lord wants you to land. <laughs> you are cordially invited to do something of significance that makes families and communities and neighborhoods and organizations and auxiliaries better places to worship and to work and to live in. To do something with your call and your ordination. Selflessly to make a place better than you found it. What invitation? The one where you are cordially invited to surrender your life on your own terms so that you can accept Christ on his terms. Yes, an invitation to sacrifice some passions and desires and attitudes and wants. Sacrifice your time and your treasure. Putting everything that you have and who you are into the hands of the Savior for his glory and not your own. All the credit check marks on the Lord's side of the ledger. It is thy will be done invitation. You are invited to have your heart broken by the tragedies of this world. And at the same time, preach through your own heartbreaking moments. Even when you're physically drained and emotionally exhausted. Even when you have given all that you can and there's nothing left to give. You are cordially invited to receive divine energy so that you can walk and not grow weary and run and not faint. To be strong in the Lord because his yoke is easy and his burdens are light. What, what invitation are you talking about, preacher? Well... The one where you are invited to exchange your weaknesses for the Lord's strength, your weariness for the Lord's power, your ideas for the Lord's visions, your plans for the plans he has for you, plans not to harm but to prosper you. That's the Bible. That's where you say amen. <laughs> You're cordially invited to make bricks without straw to make the impossible look easy, to stretch an offering, to love hard folk into loving you back, to raise a, a, a budget and raise the roof with Holy Ghost preaching and high praise. You, beloved, are cordially invited to serve where the potential is great and also to serve in hard places to congregations with problems. Lots of them. Where there are people with needs. Lots of them. Buildings that need fixing up. Lots of them. Neighborhoods in pain with disruptive distractions like poverty and homelessness and drugs and human trafficking and unreliable food and water resources. Jesus faced his own set of problems in Luke's Gospel chapter 4. He faced an enemy that challenged his belief system. Oh, it was just a few days after the glorious time where John did what he was supposed to do. And the word was spoken that this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. And now ah, there's a tempter in the desert appealing to human privilege. You want power? I can give it to you. You want riches? I can give you that too. You want the applause of the world? You got it. All you have to do is switch alliances from God. To me, oh, how tempting. The call of God didn't exempt Jesus from hurt nor danger. And Jesus didn't die to keep us safe. Jesus died to make us dangerous. How dangerous are you? Well, Jesus said you would do even greater things. Isn't that right? 
You can bind and loose, right? You can declare and declare and decree. You can plead the blood. You can cast out devils. You can send for the elders to pray when some was sick. How dangerous are you? Every morning from your knees, you have the power of prayer in your spiritual arsenal to shake up hell and storm the gates of hell and send hell back to hell and scare the living hell out of hell because the gates of hell shall not prevail. And remember, that's from your knees. And when you get off your knees, life and death is in your mouth. So speak life. You can engage in life transformation, character correcting, resource identifier to co-create and create with Christ a ministry that breaks up the darkness of this world and ushers people into the marvelous light of Jesus Christ. You're cordially invited, yes you are, to refuse to be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because this is the Lord's response to the tempter. It is written, it is written, it is written. Nor do you need to be ashamed because of what the Lord does for you. You don't need to be ashamed because God blesses you. You don't need to be ashamed of the anointing that is poured out upon you without coveting somebody else's gift. The gifting and the call, the ain't fair favor shown to you, the prayer answered because you pray the doors that God could only open for you. You didn't open it yourself. The chances you got, the mistakes that were forgiven, the miracle making in the face of a sea of naysayers, be not ashamed nor intimidated by those who see your blessing as their failure. You're cordially invited. Did I say that? To hold your head up when resentment surrounds you because you already know promotion is of the Lord. And wait, wait for it. If you humble yourself before the Lord, he will lift you up. For he speaks from eternity. If I be lifted up from the earth, I'll draw all humankind unto me. You're cordially invited to bless the Lord at all times. In the midst of mean-spirited and jealous attitudes, for no petty formed against you will prosper. You're cordially invited to preach the word in season and out of season. As Paul charged young Timothy, inviting, invited to convince and rebuke with endurance, long-suffering, to teach and at the same time walk worthy of your call. The invitation matters. And it doesn't come the same way to everyone. To Paul, it was public on a road with other people around him. He heard what other people didn't see, and he saw what others could not see. Paul's invitation didn't arrive in isolation while and when he had nothing else to do. He was on his way somewhere, and suddenly the trajectory of his life changed forever. And I dare say all of us were going somewhere. We were minding our own business, weren't we? We had our cute little plans, our 5, 10, and 15-year little plans. And Jesus called our names, and everything changed. And there was no compelling conversation in Genesis 12. God commands, and Abraham obeys. The boy, Samuel, hears a voice in the middle of the night that was discomforting. And then his mentor came to tell him what to say next time. Uh, just say, speak, Lord, your servant is listening. Moses' call came not in the early morning, years of life, but late in life. He was a second career prophet who demonstrated hesitancy when excuses when his invitation was issued from a bush that burned but was not consumed. In each of these calls, God initiates the conversation. There is an intention getter, a bush that says, come here, an emergency that says, listen, a flash of light that helps you to see an event that makes you drop your pots and run back into a hostile community and preach your trial sermon, come see a man who told me everything about myself. A cross event, some stones rolled away, an intention getter God calls and God sent. Abraham, go where I send you. Samuel, get up and listen. Moses, go and tell Pharaoh. Paul, go to the Gentiles. Ezekiel, go to the valley 
of dry bone. And with every call, there is a sending. Didn't you get sent? It may not be pretty. It may not be cute. It may not be a big, high, steeple, manicured lawns and a wealthy zip code. But with the call, there is a sending. And wherever the call sends you, you have exactly what you need for the where you're being sent. In fact, they were waiting for you to come. And this invitation, as one scholar puts it, is more like being invited to a land through where a river runs, where the called out ones are impregnated by the river. And the called out ones, though death and danger lurks, can draw life from the wonderful fruitfulness of the river, <sighs> the invitation, that we used to sing in Sunday school oh, when I was a little girl. I got a river of life flowing out of me, make the lame to walk and blind the sea. It is an invitation to participate in a relationship that doesn't dissolve the prophet's sense of self or a one-way absorption into the transcendency of God. It reminds me of the words of Jesus, I will be with you always, even to the ends of the earth. The words of comfort spoken to Moses, I shall be with you. So no matter, preacher, where you were called to serve and how you were called to serve, what happens in the serving, the context of service or in the community, you are cordially invited to never be alone. It is written. Can I exegete the text now? So here comes Isaiah, remember, in chapter 6, having a life-changing experience in an unusual way after a great loss that brings about a great change. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Can I, can I contextualize this verse this way? Will you allow me to do that? In the year... When a pandemic changed everything, I saw the Lord. In the year that the church closed down, I, I saw the Lord. In the year that the church closed down but the liquor store stayed open because the liquor store was more essential than the church, I saw the Lord high and lifted up. In the year when the war in Ukraine triggered the largest and fastest global human displacement crisis in decades, I saw the Lord in the year that there has been more mass shootings than days in the year, I saw the Lord. In the year that there is less voter protection for marginalized people since the 1950s, I saw the Lord. In the year where American democracy is under threat, I saw the Lord. In the year of unbearable heat in the West and floods in the East and wildfires in Canada and catastrophic climate event, I saw the Lord high and lifted up. And the post of the doors was shaken and the house was filled with smoke. Whatever it was about Uzziah that obscured Isaiah's vision, whatever it was about this king's administration that hid the truth about what was really going on, when whatever shrouded reality was removed, then verse 5 says, then the light came on and darkness retreated into the shadows then he could see himself, and he said, woe is me, I am undone. The closet is open, the skeletons are seen, my shortcomings are on display, my lips are unclean, and I dwell in the midst of people with unclean lips too. Could it be this is where the prophet breaks out singing an old Michael Jackson song? <laughs> I'm, I'm staring. I'm starting with the man in the mirror. I'm asking him to change his ways. And no message could have been any clearer. If you want to make the world a better place, take a look at yourself first and then make a change. Then the text goes on to say that a seraphim flew to me having a live coal. The message Bible says he took the thong and then took the coal from the altar. And he touched my mouth with it and said, behold, this has touched your lips, your iniquities, your sins have been uploaded and taken away. 
and your sin purged. Then a divine need was expressed, an invitation extended. Isaiah said, also, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send and who will go for us? And then I said, here am I, send me. Remember now there was trouble in the land and Israel had become too complacent with his own security depending on itself and stopped related, uh, depending upon God. And Isaiah, who did real good for 52 years, in the end it didn't end well. And all of Israel was shaken or needed to be shaken by the vision of the Lord, high and lifted up. But the vision announced the sovereignty of God, not the sovereignty of humankind. Kings competed but failed, and people worshiped idols, but false gods crumbled, and people refused to trust God, and a pagan will be sent as an instrument of judges. Yet, and I just love the yet parts of this gospel, yet, 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 the sovereign Lord promises to preserve a remnant through whom the Savior will come and set up an ultimate reign when swords are beaten in the plowshares and the lion will lie down with the lamb, and Isaiah leaves no shadows, no doubt. This is God who writes the script of human history. You will cordially invited to be on the same page with God. Ah, but what brings us to this text, however, is the tension between two verses. Because no matter how great the call, how great the ministry, how great the setting aside of the called out ones, how great the wisdom, power, divine, how great the take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to thee, in the midst of loss, there is change, and in the midst of crisis, there's an opportunity. Winston Churchill is purported to having said, never waste a good crisis, facing the pandemic of his own era, it was called World War II. And Ron Emanuel, President Barack Obama's chief of staff said, facing a financial crisis, you never want a serious crisis to go to, crisis to, go to waste. It's an opportunity to do things you think you could never do before. And so what looks like an end can become a new beginning. And what looks like a closed door is just a hurdle. And what looks like a, as a blockade is a chance to pivot. And my dad was a track star at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Hey, badgers in the house. And he wanted his daughter to follow in his track shoes. Seriously. <laughs> and so where he taught it at high school, he coached me after school with his high school team. And one day when I lost a race that required more endurance than speed, I was crushed. I was ready to quit. I was tired. I was tired of getting up early in the morning and going to practice. I was tired of eating training table, had to give up sodas and hamburgers and milkshakes. I was tired of staying up late to keep up with my schoolwork. And the ride home was long and silent. Ever had one of them long, silent rides home? And finally, my dad said, you did good today. And I said, how do you mean good today? I lost. He said, yes, but you finished the race. The problem was endurance, not talent. And we can work on endurance as long as you keep running. Years later, I finally asked him why he said what he said that day in that long, silent road home. And my dad responded, your potential was greater than your problem. And your problem brought out your potential. Shall I say that again? He said your potential was greater than your problem, and your problem brought out your potential. And so these first nine verses in Isaiah, the problem of loss and the potential of change, there's a problem of sin and the potential of forgiveness. There's a tension between two realities that describe the gospel ministry. There's the woe is me, and I'm ruined, I'm undone. And at the same time, there's here my Lord, send me. Problem and divine potential. The problem was when Isaiah saw the Holy One, the Sovereign Lord, he looked within himself and the doorposts and thresh thresholds of his life were shaken. And there will come a time in ministry, if it hasn't happened yet, when there will be a woe is me that escapes from your lips. For we are all human, subject to all the frailties and frailties of humanity. And when we look in the mirror and know 
that we know things about ourselves that people do not know and hope they never will, we say, woe is me. And when the church leaves you disillusioned and people disappoint you and your feelings get hurt, you want to say, whoa. Well, when you crawl into bed at night exhausted and second-guessing yourself, when you regret a bad decision or recall what you have done and left undone, whoa. When there is disagreement and conflict in the church and you want to run away because you're tired of getting up early and tired of staying up late, when you don't know what to do, and that you're being asked for more than you think you have or you feel lost or overwhelmed, whoa! Remember that your divine potential is greater than your problem and your problem will bring out your divine potential. <laughs> Isaiah opened his heart to God and his words are self-reckoning, a recognition of his responsibility as well as his accountability. This old oh Lord moment when the truth comes marching in, this is where we want to say, it's me, it's me, oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer again. This is where you see all to Jesus, I surrender, I surrender all again. This is the place where you say, God, tell me one more time why you want me to do this. Am I the only one in the room? Am I the only one in the room? And the second line from the twin realities is this. Here am I. The problem brought out his divine potential. Just like Jesus said, in this life there will be tribulations. And as Luke says, the devil departed until there was another opportune time. There will also be days. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. When you touch divine mastery and you weep with joy and your life is aglow with gratitude and you say, here I am, Lord. And at times you will be overwhelmed by the intimacy of pastoral care and amazed by the trust placed in you and the secret shared with you. And you want to say, here am I. And circumstances and people will call you more deeply into ministry. And you will say things you didn't know you knew to say and do things you never thought you could. And you say, here am I. And then there are days when your heart will break for the pain of the world and the hurt of God's people. And you will be filled with such compassion that you cannot contain. You say, here am I. And there will be days when the word of God will burn on the inside of you. And you'll preach because it's hurt. And you keep preaching until it's healed. Here am I. And you will weep with joy at the baptism of a child or the marriage of a couple or the reconciliation of a, pen, of a penitent. Here am I. And you'll catch a glimpse of the train of the Lord's robe filling the temple of your life. And you'll discover that you're stronger than you ever thought you were. And you can see the whole earth is filled with the glory of God. Here. And people will love and shepherd you in ways that will heal and transform your life. You will hear the insistence of God through the words and actions of love, mercy, wisdom, and compassion. And some nights you will fall into bed exhausted, thankful for having been sent, and excited and ready to go again. Do you hear this tension, the paradox in these two lines from Isaiah, that the tension in which we live our ministry? One is calling us to be humble, and the other is calling us to be courageous. One is calling us to reckoning, and the other is calling us a wounded healer, battered and bruised, and the Lord still has need of thee. One is calling you to be honest, and the other is calling you to be faithful. One is your confession, and the other is your profession. One is calling you to be authentic, and the other is calling you to be obedient. One says you need help, and the other says help is needed and available. And between the first reality, the recognizing the problem, the second reality, the divine, the divine potential that brings out the divine potential from the problem, there is a pause. What pause? Well, look a little closer. 
Between the acknowledgement, I am undone, and then I'll go, there's a pause. How so? Remember now, his lips were burned. Did, did not the text say that the angel took a coal from the altar and placed it on the lips? The lips are burned. How can you start talking when your lips are burned? There had to be a pause, a moment where healing takes place. There was no, no emergency first responders on the scene. You see that there? There were no visits to the ER. There were no bandages. Only the bomb in Gilead who soothes the sin-sick heart. There was a healing pause. Hmm. Pause is an exhaustion management tool. But frustration can wear you out. Pause between I'm done and I'll go. For it's in the pause that allows you to rest, get a good night's sleep that restores your energy level, preventing further decline. It's the same strategy that God used with Elijah. God didn't give the prophet fresh from a huge victory over the prophets of Ella pep talk. Get back in there, Elijah. God didn't pat him on the back. God didn't say, suck it up. Prophet, God didn't say, this is your cross to bear. God didn't say, you're not the only one. Everybody's going through the same thing. God didn't give him the oh ye little faith lecture. But God gave him food, told him to sleep twice. Twice. Tell your neighbor, push pause. Mm -hmm. Tell your neighbor, push pause. When you pause, it gives you time to think. Examine yourself. Push pause. Check yourself out. Check what's really happening in the moment. Huh? Push pause. Go talk to somebody about it. Go, go to the movies. Read a book. Take an afternoon nap. Do you not know that Sunday nap after worship is a ministry? Push pause opens the door for you to investigate the moment and pause creates a space for you to see options that you did not see before. In that tension, you will witness the sufferings of Christ and share in the glory to be revealed. You will walk through shadowed valleys and go from glory to glory. You will stumble and the Lord will lift you up. You will be thrown into the pits and walk in treacherous places with hinds feet. You will be battle weary and become battle ready. If you just push pause, you will be human and you will be empowered by a power divine. So, so this week, sit down. When I was a little girl, my mother would say, go sit yourself down somewhere. <laughs> sit down. Eat a good meal. Fellowship with one another. Learn how to shake hands again. Fellowship with those who were going through what you went through. Or fellowship with those who are going through what you're going through now. Reestablish those boundaries to protect your pause pushing time. Be, as Peter says, an example to the flock. Teach them how to push pause too. In the tension, we face our humanity and become acquainted with divinity. Come on, find and refine that peace for yourself and help people to find it for themselves. You are cordially invited, didn't I say that? To push pause, to acquire what Seraphim of Savro says, acquire a peaceful spirit and around you thousands will be saved. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrow like sea billows roll, Whatever my lot, thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. God bless you and thank you.